welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. There's a Neil Gaiman quote where he says, style is the stuff we get wrong. And I love that quote because it gives you permission to, to disobey the rules and to, to throw away the textbook. And that's when it becomes more enjoyable and you're kind of like sticking it to your old teacher and you're like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to break the rules here, but you're breaking the rules because you know the rule. I don't like the line that rules are made to be broken. Most of good copywriting does have rules that you follow, but there are certain things that I purposely do wrong because it feels right to me and I just go with it. And it turns out that people like that and not everybody, but it's a good way of identifying your audience. Hi there, Innovator. It's really great to be back with you again and with another episode of the Innova Buzz podcast. I hope your week's been awesome so far. And I hope you enjoyed my recent conversations with Kathy Salet from Performance of a Lifetime and with Murray Streets of BC and F Dentsu. I'm really excited today to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Justin Blackman of Pretty Fly Copywriting. Justin specializes in analyzing and documenting brand voice. He uses his brand ventriloquist framework to break down a person's writing style in a way that others can then emulate it. So writers can use it to sound like their client or their business owner. Quite a fascinating concept, really, and it's all about style guides for copywriters. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where... In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Justin talked to me about how to write from the perspective of your customer's situation. He explained how reading online reviews can help with our writing. And he also explained why you should look at your fish. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Justin Blackman. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast as my guest from the greater Atlanta area in Georgia, the USA, Justin Blackman of Pretty Fly Copywriting, and Justin's also known as the brand ventriloquist. So that's going to be an interesting one to explore. Welcome to the podcast, Justin. It's a great privilege to have you here today as my guest. Thanks for having me. Summer Awais, who was our guest on episode 249 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we get you on and have a chat, Justin. So a big hello to Summer as well. Yeah, she's great. I'm a big fan of hers. Hmm. Well, we had a great conversation too. So Justin, as I said, you're um, a brand ventriloquist. So you create in-depth voice guides for small and medium-sized businesses that help their writers stay on brand and be consistent. It helps them nail their copy, reduces the editing time, produces perfect drafts very early on, usually on the first shot when that's done well. And in a way, it's like a style manual for how you write across every channel. And of course, your 
a copywriter by trade and you've kind of taken all your knowledge and skills that you've built up over the years and built it into a product. So I'm really looking forward to exploring all those things with you today. But before we start talking about all things copywriting and voice guide and branding, tell us a little bit about your background. How, how did you get to where you are today and what were some of the pivotal moments in that journey? Uh, it's a twisted path. I don't know of any <laughs> copywriter who actually started out wanting to be a copywriter. Uh, I'd say at this point, I'm probably on the third iteration of my career. Uh, I started out in sports marketing where I booked athletes for corporate appearances, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, but that led to field marketing where I ran a lot of sampling programs for like Red Bull, Five Hour Energy, uh, Keurig, Puma. So the Red Bull cars with the big can on the back, I managed mm -hmm. that program in oh, uh, wow. Savannah, Georgia yeah. and Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, I also helped create a training program for uh, the, the sampling teams. What that opportunity gave me a chance to speak to thousands upon thousands of consumers. And we were in every type of scenario. So we were on military bases, college campuses, white collar offices, blue collar offices, NASCAR races, uh, football, college events, just every, every situation you can imagine. We were talking to those people day in, day out. So I pull on that that experience on a daily basis. So it gave me a chance to really experience so much, which has made me a better copywriter. The problem with field marketing is about every three years, I found myself out of work. It just, it's the, the, night, the, night, the cycle of the industry there. I tried to start a freelance business and I thought maybe I could have my own little field marketing agency. So the first thing I did was go to set up a website and I was very good at talking to people and I've always enjoyed writing, but I knew that writing was different than talking. So I wanted to see what's the best way to create a headline and what do I need to, what are the sections that I need on my website? And I fell down the rabbit hole of copywriting. I spent six months researching every single thing that I could about writing. And it essentially became my full-time job. The problem was I never actually launched my freelance business because I was so <laughs> enthralled with like what I should write that I never wrote anything. And then I ran out of money. <laughs> so, um, but the good news is that taught me how to write a very good cover letter. And that landed me a job as a content manager with a hotel company uh, where I managed 12 different brands and had to write in the voices of, of 12 international hotels. And gave me a, just a, a tremendous amount of writing experience. Uh, from there, I went freelance, uh, did a couple of big experiments where I dove into just ridiculous tasks. I wrote 100 headlines a day for 100 days for 100 different brands. And that just taught me different styles and different techniques. Ultimately, I landed a job uh, retainer uh, when I went freelance, I landed a, re a retainer client where I was writing long form Facebook ads and emails for clients. That gave me the experience of writing for 329 different people. And the only common thread was that I was able to nail different styles quickly. And it wasn't until I started talking about that, that I realized that voice is the unique factor that I've gotten really well. And it's because I have a mathematical process for measuring voice and the elements of it and we can nerd out on that if you want later but uh, that's what led me into teaching other writers how to do what i do mm. Mm. that's fascinating uh interesting journey that um you know a lot of people say that they actually kind of pivoted several times and it was actually very haphazard and unplanned and then it sounds um in hindsight like it's a really good strategic uh pathway that that you followed so i think that this is the case as well you know, yeah you, there's you, a, there's definitely a red thread in there but i didn't know it and i didn't know that i was on this path hmm. okay now one of the things that you talked about there in in that story was the your experience with the hotels where it was a chain in was it 12 different countries uh it was worldwide it was 12 different chains chains okay worldwide so each chain had different branding and, and I'm guessing a very different audience perhaps. And, and so that writing was, was very different for each one of them. Is that right? 
Yeah, we had the parent brand, then we had the uh, the membership level, and then each hotel had its own u- unique audience. And these were big hotels. So uh, we're talking, uh, well, actually, I can say it now is the company was IHG. So it was the parent brand of Holiday Inn, Crown Plaza, Intercontinental, um, tons and tons of hotels all around the world. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So like each piece, intercontinental would be toward corporate travelers, like high-end business travelers versus like, uh, say, a Staybridge Suites where it's extended stay uh, versus Holiday Inn, which is family travel, versus Holiday Inn Express, which is solo business traveler. So every voice was different. And Hmm. every time we created a piece of content, we had to adapt it 12 different ways. Okay, so... What are some of the things you learned then in in doing that? Um, because you talked about the mathematical process you've developed of getting to the voice that that is is the authentic voice of that particular brand. But what what are some of the things you learned there? That was interesting because <laughs> that was more of a, a challenge of learning how to work with so many people and different agencies. Because there was, I, get, I think, the biggest issue there is. Creative and any type of writing or photos, things like that, everybody has an opinion on it. So (laughs) that was more of a lesson of learning how to manage expectations and knowing what to fight for and what you would surrender to the hippo in the room, which is the highest paid person's opinion, (laughs) favorite acronyms. So we had to deal a lot with, uh, you know, here's the best version that I that I'm going to go for. And then everybody wants to put their fingerprints on it and it changes quite a bit. So it was there. I learned what to fight for and what really wouldn't affect conversion so much. <laughs> that was more of a less of a, more of a learning in, uh, in dealing with people than voice, but I definitely mm-hmm. learned a lot about voice too. Um, but that was just figuring out the main features to focus, uh, to focus on the main benefits. And, you know, a lot of people would want to stay because they want great experiences. Other people were just in and out for a night and they just wanted the points, which they would redeem later on for vacations or kayaks or, um, you know, digital downloads, all types of different things. So we just had to figure out the needs and the wants of the customers and then figure out the best way to position it, Uh, whether it was more of a highfalutin type of voice or more of a kid-friendly type thing. So it was... Some brands had exclamation points, some had none. Uh, and just the way that it came across, the tones were very, very different across every brand. So the starting point really is getting clear about who the customers are and, and what their needs and wants are. Yes. Yes, that's a big one. Uh, you know, figuring out what they want and then how to say it. We had to appeal to the the inner emotions and stay on theme with the brand and how to position it. So there was, there was just so many different types. And then we had the parent brand, which tried to speak to everyone. So mm. it was, it was always a challenge. It was fun. I had to accept it. And it, there were times that I hated the fact that I had to adapt everything so many ways, but it was also, it taught me perfectly for how to, uh, to, to dive in on voice later on. Okay. Well, let's take a step back then. And, um, ask the question, what is brand ventriloquism and how did that term come about? <laughs> There's another thing that happened by accident. <laughs> uh, it, it became, I was talking to a bunch of other writers and I've said that I've essentially just become a, a dummy for, uh, for other writers where I just learned how to throw my voice and sound exactly like other people. And, uh, just randomly said brand ventriloquist and then everybody's ears perked up. They all looked at me and said, well, what's that? Yeah. And I said, I don't know, but maybe I should figure it out if everyone keeps asking. So uh, I kind of dove in and adapted that theme. And essentially it, it's a system for how business owners and content teams can throw their voice. It's how other people can say the words that are coming out of their mouths or their pens or the keyboards. And it's a it's a system where we, we mathematically break down someone's writing style. And the key elements there are your vocabulary, which is the level of words that you use, uh, whether it's like first grade language or college language or somewhere in the middle. 
uh, there are ways of grading this and there are different tools that you can use like the Hemingway app where you run your copy through and it will tell you what grade level you're on. So that's the level of your vocabulary. Then there's the tone, which are the underlying emotions behind your writing. And that could be anything from joy to fear to anger to surprise, excitement. Everybody has, every piece, every good piece has an emotion that's there. And they're usually pretty consistent. So once you analyze that, you know how to approach the writing. So now we know what, what level words to use. And now we know the, um, the, the, the underlying tone. And then the last piece is the cadence, which is the rhythm of your writing. Some people write long, flowy, wordy bird sentences that go on and on and on and paint vivid pictures and have an average word length of, say, 32 words per sentence. Other people are short and choppy. So once you can figure out the literally the mathematical amount of average commas that you use per sentence and your average sentence length and the style, the way that you're paid, the way that your writing actually looks on the page, you can learn to mimic different styles and have it fit within a brand. And these things make tremendous difference in the way that uh, it looks on the page, the way that it is perceived by the world. And uh, you can change what people hear when you write simply by tweaking any of these three elements. Hmm. That's fascinating. So, so what, what you do then is, well, tell us exactly what you do first and why you do it, and then we'll sure. explore that a little bit more. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. So the vocabulary, tone, and cadence, that's, that's the core elements of voice. The brand ventriloquist framework, I've got a witty, snarky, kind of silly vibe to my style. The brand ventriloquist framework is words, tone, and frequency, which is the WTF framework. So yeah. WTF is your voice? No, WTF is your voice. So it's your words, your tone, and your frequency. So that's me playing with the vocabulary. It's the exact same thing as, vo as uh, vocabulary, tone, and cadence, just said in a sillier way. So essentially what I do is I, is I plot out, I, I analyze the heck out of people's writings. I take their essential content, their key pieces, the things that have resonated the most with their audience, their favorite pieces, and I look at it under a microscope and I analyze every single piece and I find the common themes that are prevalent throughout and I find the patterns and I, I analyze them and I document them. So any writer who's coming on board will be able to immediately grab on to how things should be sound, uh, how things should be written, how they should sound, how they should look on the page, you know, the, even the types of formatting that you use like if you're excited do you italicize the words you use all caps little things that will especially if you're a personal brand identify the reading at the writing as yours and your fans that anyone that is sort of uh, been following your your writing for a long time will be able to identify it as yours hmm. so in in a way it's kind of doing for words what a graphic designer might do in a style guide. It's exactly what it is. It's a style mm. guide for writing. Yeah. Yeah, so instead of your colors and your fonts, it's your words and your tones. Mm. Okay, so what are some of the tips you have then for ways to connect with your audience that will actually get them to sit up and pay attention to you? So let's say you've got this style of writing, but you actually want to improve on that because you're unhappy with the responses you're getting. This is where it gets interesting because one of the key things that I do is when I, when I analyze styles and I present back to the client, here's what you sound like. A lot of times they'll be stunned. I'm like, I had no idea that I did that. Um, hmm. I wrote for a couple of big lifestyle coaches that didn't realize that one of the prevalent themes in their writing was pain and fear. And they're like, yeah. no, but I'm all about joy and happiness. It's like, mm. right, you are, but you're, you can go as dark as you want because you also bring people to the light. Whereas, and they're like, but I don't want to do that. And I was like, well, that's what you do and it's working. So <laughs> embrace it and <laughs> let's figure out how to work with it. Or if it's something that they really don't like, we were able to analyze those sections and then they can learn how to write without them. And, you know, you can adapt over time. And one of the things that I love doing is 
brands that are new or are just not happy with how they sound will analyze their favorite brands and we'll figure out what elements we can use to begin to sound more like them. And because we're taking so many different pieces from different brands, we essentially hodgepodge an own unique style that's not identifiable as like, oh, they're just trying to sound like Apple or um, Snapple or you know any other Apple r- rhyming words, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't see it as a Me Too or a cheap knockoff or a caricature of a voice. You see it as something new and unique because the elements aren't immediately identifiable. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things that I'm interested in, we were having this conversation briefly before we started recording is that you've built this skill set, um, and you've been working with clients to help them build their brand voice and, and build star guides, if you like, for their writers. Mm-hmm. And and now you're looking to develop that into a course that you can teach other people to do the same thing and also working with them to develop their own brand guide. So talk us through the process that – that well, talk us through why you're doing that first and the process, how you're going about that. Well, the main goal is to allow a CEO of a small business or really just anyone that's doing the marketing to remove themselves from the content machine. So many, especially solo entrepreneurs and gurus and uh, sort of the industry leaders, they they have a unique voice and they have a unique style. And one of their biggest concerns is my voice is so unique, nobody can sound like me. Hmm. And they they can't let go of creating the emails because it's like, well, it has to sound like me and my, my audience will know. What I do is I show people, yes, your voice is unique, but it still fits on the graph. No one is beyond the formula. So we can still plot your voice and now I can help you find a writer or we can train your existing writers to just hover around that point that we plotted on the graph and everything will begin to sound like you. Um, Some of the biggest industry leaders in the world have copywriters that write their their speeches. Um, Presidents all throughout history have had speech writers. There is definitely a style that is repeatable. Uh, And my goal is to help business owners realize that this is something that they can outsource. You can outsource your voice. You don't have to be involved in all the content. And one of the great things about copywriters is we know the techniques for writing. So the formats, the templates, the, the different ways of persuasion, the email sequences that should be going out when someone signs up to your, uh, to your newsletters or your, your daily emails, whatever it is. You can create more content that you don't have to touch yourself other than say, yes, no, let's change this and then be done with it. So my goal is to free the business owner from the content grind. The mm. way that I do it is with the, the, the training course that we have, it's called the Codex Persona. And that is where we train writers to, to, to use the same tools that I just mentioned, where we have different websites that we can run copy through and really come in and document the voice. So the CEO can, or whoever the, whoever is doing email now can outsource it and be happy with the, the content that's coming in. Mm, mm, That's fascinating. And so how does that work in practice then? Let's say I have a writer. Do I just say, look, we need to send out a series of emails related to this particular um, launch and and then I and they've got enough information from that to write the first drafts that essentially I'm probably going to okay. Yeah, that's it. It's uh, you usually have to have a quick the, the writing guides do all the onboarding process for how you want it to sound. The writer still needs to know what to write. Hmm. That's where a little short conversation comes in saying, hey, we're going to be launching this business. Here's the here are the main benefits and features of it. Can you take this and create a series of emails to go out with it? And that's it. You just have to steer them in the right direction and give them the resources of what they're writing about. But then they take the guide, which does all of the heavy lifting of the onboarding, and they're able to create the sequence for you. The fact is, when it comes to emailing and launching or doing whatever your audience is doing, there is a science behind 
when things should go out and what those emails should be talking about or what your landing page is, is going to be about, what your homepage should look like, what your, uh, if you have a, like a long form sales letter, there is a distinct and, and very important art and science that goes into all that, that the average person doesn't know, but a good copywriter will. What the voice guy does is it takes the, the style that's in your head, plus the, the knowledge that's in the writer's head, and it meshes it. And it just gets you that perfect draft of uh, a landing page that one works and two sounds like you. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly a, a very attractive proposition for a lot of people that would be um, in small business and spending a lot of time creating content themselves. Yeah, the whole idea is just to, to free them up from the content grind. Hmm. Okay, now um, coming back to some specifics around copy, what what um, what are some tips that you've learned along the way for good copy that you might be able to share with us today? Essentially, good copy sounds nothing like your high school English teacher taught you. <laughs> uh, there's so many rules to formal English writing and just general writing that don't work because we're right to sound that we're taught to write pretty with lots of adjectives and adverbs and describing words and vivid imagery. Great copy. The writing actually becomes invisible. Uh, there are certain, especially like on sales letters, you want what's being said to preempt how it's being said. Uh, the style should almost be invisible. Now, for personal brands, that changes a little bit. But like, if you look at some of the best direct response ads, which means that it's an ad that's driving you to to an action to buy something, a lot of those like long form pages that you see, the words get you cheering and saying ident identifying that this is for you and it's hitting on your pain points. And there's a ton of research to that, but there are probably going to be no adverbs. There's different things about passive voice and active voice and when you want to use them. There's just the styles, the lengths of the sentences, the amount of commas that you use. There is definitely a science to this and everything your high school English teach you, the teacher taught you is probably working against you. You know, certain examples would be uh, adverbs, um, words that end in L-Y. So like you're really going to like this. An adverb is a sign of a weak verb. So really going to like, if you improve the verb, it's love. You're going to love this. That's stronger and it's a more powerful statement than really like. So, you know, that, that's just one small example. Hmm. And then there's just little style elements like the rule of three, which is this weird thing, but it works over and over where our brain is taught to identify patterns and the, the smallest pattern you can have is three. So when you're writing by looping things in sets of three makes your copy more readable, more understandable, more likable. And it's just easier to comprehend. It's just these strange little techniques that, that science has proved worked because we have the, we can test data. We have all the numbers behind it. It's all there. It's just, not stuff that you learn at school. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? We're, we're taught um, proper grammar and we spend a lot of time writing. Certainly, I, I know I spent a lot of time writing. I never really enjoyed it that much. Now I do actually enjoy writing, but I probably ignore most of those grammar rules. <laughs> so maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm doing That's the right thing. One. Yeah, yeah. No, it absolutely is. There's a Neil Gaiman quote where he says, style is the stuff we get wrong. And... I love that quote because it gives you permission to to disobey the rules and to to throw away the textbook. And that's when it becomes more enjoyable and you're kind of like sticking it to your old teacher and you're <laughs> like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to break the rules here. But you're breaking the rules because you know the rule. I don't like the line that rules are made to be broken. Most of good copywriting does have rules that you follow. But there are certain things that I purposely do wrong because it feels right to me. And I just go with it. And it turns out that people like that. 
Hmm. Not everybody, but it's a good way of identifying your audience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on the topic of, you know, some people won't like it and that uh, we you mentioned earlier about the importance of knowing your audience and their wants and needs. So talk to us a little bit about your process for understanding the audience and and particularly in relation to how do you then write copy that resonates with them? This is actually, this ties back to Red Bull when I was doing the field marketing and I've spoken to thousands and thousands of people is I'm able to write quicker because I can empathize and I, I've literally spoken to people in, in thousands of of different situations. And I put myself back into whatever time or whatever location that was. And I remember talking to them and I remember the, the look on their face then what I actually try to do is it's almost like the method acting approach where I switch into their body and I try to embrace that. Uh, now that's something that I can do relatively quickly and it's good for in and out projects where I'm just kind of writing an email for someone and trying to depict their audience for larger scale processes. When you are writing like uh, long form sales pages or, long magazine ads, things like that. There is a ridiculous amount of research that is involved in that. Um, Customer interviews, uh, snooping through Facebook groups, um, (laughs) not in a creepy way, but you, that's where people go to complain Hmm. and you go and you see what they're talking about. One of my favorite things to do is going on Amazon and, you know, let's say that you're writing to someone going through a divorce and, you can go look at marriage counseling books and like love advice and read the reviews of the books on Amazon and you'll find amazing language and you can literally just pull that, that those words and inject it into your copy. The stuff that people say online, the real reviews are better than anything that you can come up with in your head. It's real. It's emotional. It's raw. It's unedited. It's imperfect. And that's what makes it true. That's what makes the best writing. It comes from a ridiculous amount of research. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a great tip. I never thought of that. And I, I tend to look at online reviews when I'm considering purchasing something and I see what other people have said about it. And sometimes you have to smile at what they've said, whether you know both the good and the bad. Um, but you're right, it is, it's very uh, raw and emotional at some times. Yeah. And that's it. It's the reviews that sell it. So essentially what you're doing is rather like you can read the blurbs on the book, but that'll get you interested. Mm. But it's when you read the reviews and see that other people like this, then that's the social proof that you need to convert. What good copywriting does is it essentially takes that social proof that that sold you and it highlights it and it just strips away all the unnecessary stuff in between. And it only shows you the good stuff that people are saying. Hmm. Fascinating. All right. Well, let's touch on headlines. You mentioned earlier that you had this phase where you wrote 100 headlines in 100 days. And and I imagine there's lots of lessons out of that. What makes up a good headline? (laughs) There's a lot. It depends on the audience and it depends on what you're doing. But it's got to be interesting. Uh, It's got to be unique. And it has to be believable. But Almost to the point of like just pushing it. Like, no, that can't be right. You know, what, what, what's, what's there? So the more specific you can get, the better. So there's some great headlines that just kind of make you curious. And there's like the BuzzFeed tactics, the clickbait, which everyone has moved beyond. But it's like, 12 ways to entertain your cat and oh my God, you're not going to believe number nine. Hmm. And like, those are clickbait. That's just straight out clickbait that I hate and I am adamantly against, but the science behind that and what it's based off of some of the old proven techniques that date back to like the 1940s and great advertising from then the science is there. It's a curiosity where, you know, 12 ways to entertain your cat, maybe, Uh, possibly I'd click that. But 
oh my God, you're not going to believe number nine. Like, Wait, what, what's number nine? And all of a sudden you're curious and you have that open loop where your brain wants an answer. Yeah. Uh, whether it's even just to prove like, oh, number nine, that's ridiculous. But you've already read eight of them <laughs> to get to number nine. And maybe yeah. you'll keep yeah. on reading the whole article and maybe you'll click. So I do not approve of clickbait articles, but the curiosity angle does make a good headline. They should be short. Uh, well, they should be as short as they need to be. There's actually some headlines that are ridiculously long and they're done that way for a reason. So I will say that a good headline is never the first thing that you came up with. Um, I literally wrote a hundred headlines every single day for 100 days. And whatever I started with, I always just started with like how to blank or hmm. the blank for people that want to blank the general things you're going to get a, a generic headline. And it's not necessarily bad, but if you want to get good, you have to write deep. You have to write more and more. And I will be completely upfront that with the 100 headlines that I wrote every day, at least 86 every day were terrible. <laughs> they were not good. They were useless. But I needed to get that deep in order to find the 14 good ones. Uh, you, you're never going to get it on the first shot. Yeah. It is an art. It's something that's proven. And people always say, well, can you write a great headline now? And I said, well, I don't know, but I can probably come up with way more hooks than you can. So I'm taking more shots and I have a better chance of, of getting it faster and more interesting than you. But I don't know that I can write a better headline than you. Hmm. So even on day 100, you were still at 14% good headlines. Yeah, about that. Hmm. I think the best I ever had was 20 and I wasn't testing any of these things. This was just me coming up with different angles. So I don't know that anything that I wrote would ever beat the current headlines that are out there. I'm not, I wasn't testing these, but I know that they're interesting and people like them and um, people came back and read them. So, mm -hmm. and it's all up there. It's at uh, the headline There's 10,211 headlines for 100 different companies so I encourage people to go and look through it. There's everything from, uh, I did have some stuff on tr with travel because I was writing for travel. I've got made up brands, um, like the movie Edward Scissorhands. I have uh, the Edward Scissorhands topiary service, like where he's cutting the hedges. <laughs> um, so I've got fun things like that. I've got uh, the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the company that removes memories. I have something on that. Uh, I've also got stuff on toilet training your cat or pet training your dog. Uh, I've got the fart candle, which was my, one of my favorite ones ever. So just there's everything under the sun. And if people are looking, some are, there's a lot of serious ones too, but then there's a lot of funny ones. But if anyone's ever stuck on a headline, you can go and take a look. Maybe you can be inspired. You can swipe things from there. It's all there up at theheadlineproject.com. Mm. Right. Well, that's one of the links we'll include in the show notes. So you touched on the use of humor there. Is humor something that you can use effectively in copy and, and should you be using it? Or is that come back to, again, what, <laughs> what your brand, what your voice brand is? The answer is definitely maybe. Yeah. So I love humor. <laughs> there are, I can point you to to humor writers that can talk about anything. I could talk to you, I could show you some brands that you say these people should not use humor, yet they do. Uh, we're talking about funeral homes. We're talking about financial planning. I know people that do it and it is risky, but you stand out. If it's done wrong, you've got a lot of apologizing to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a risk. It is not for everyone. Yeah. But I will say this. I have been obsessed with with comedy and stand-up comedy since i was about six years old i remember sitting in the mall as my mom went shopping reading a book on stand-up comedy when i was six the science in what makes a good joke and what makes effective copy the overlap is ridiculous there's so many similarities between them between the you know there's the punchline there's, there's the the intro, the, the setup, uh, the punchline, the hooks, the callbacks, these are all things that you'll find in comedy and in good copywriting. And the interesting word techniques, 
the way that you put your your power words on the end. It's like the difference between saying the cat was in the box and in the box was a cat. It's just it's more interesting when you have the 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 strongest word in the sentence as the last word. That's you'll see that in comedy and you'll see that in good copywriting. So I won't say that everybody should use humor, but if you learn what you like about humor and if you learn how to write a good joke, you will become a better copywriter. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, there's people that say they're good at telling jokes or are good, that they are good at telling jokes, and there's people that are probably not that good at telling jokes. They always mess up the punchlines. <laughs> Even even yes. if it's a joke that you know is scripted, somebody else has told them a really good joke, and then they mess up the punchline when they tell yeah. it to their friends. So yeah, so it they'll is. get like halfway through the story and be like, "Oh wait, wait, I forgot to tell you." Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it takes place in the desert. There oh, were... hang on, that that was the punchline. I got to go. <laughs> that goes at yeah. the end. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. and it's funny. There are actually a lot of copywriters who are former comics or even current comics. This guy, Kevin Rogers, he runs a community called Copy Chief, and he is an amazing direct response writer. He was a road comic for, I think, 12 years, um, and he he uses a lot of the, the joke writing techniques to create better copy. And he's also got a, a very fun style to his writing where he's funny. He can get a little dirty. He can get a little raunchy, but not over the, the line, but he's got this fun persona that that carries that carries through with him hmm. yeah it's a fascinating subject and we could probably dig a lot deeper on that one but i'm aware of the time so i think it's a good point to move on to the buzz which is our innovation round and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience so i've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result let's do it so firstly, what, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Oh, that's a good question because I just, uh, I'm writing a speech right now and my <laughs> answer is going to sound strange and I'll explain it. The number one thing you can do is look at your fish. Hmm. <laughs> <I> haven't had <laughs> so, an answer like that one before. <laughs> so, no, go on. <laughs> uh, there's a story. Uh, there was a professor of natural history at Harvard in the 1850s, and his name was Professor Agassiz. And on the first day of class, he would put a dead fish in front on a tin tray in front of a student and say, look at your fish. After about five minutes, the kids would be like, all right, now what? And then he would say, look at your fish. And then he would leave the room for about four hours with no direction other than that. And then they would come back and he says, what did you see? And like, well, it's dead. It stinks. It's gray. It's got scales. And he's like, okay, now go look at your fish. And then the kid would, the students would pick up pencil and they'd start like drawing the fish or they'd even go up on the board and start making like obscene cartoons about the fish. But as they were doing this, they're like, oh, wait, no, no, it's got more scales than that. Or its eyes are, it doesn't have eyelids. You drew eyelids on it. So they were starting to see things and they would just look at it and be like, oh, wait, hold on. It's, it's out of proportion. And then the professor would come in and be like, well, what have you seen? And essentially they would say, I don't know what I've seen, but I'm now seeing how little I saw before. And each day they would just look at the fish. And the only tools that he gave him for the first few days was a pencil and the fish. So they would just, they'd start to draw the fish and then, Little by little, they would see that, oh, it's symmetrical. And he'd say, yes, what does that mean? I, was, I don't know. Look at your fish. And then suddenly they realized that it has paired organs. So they were able to figure out more just by looking at every single angle of it, about the spikes in the tail, about the shape of the teeth. Well, what can you tell from the shape of the teeth? Well, that it eats uh, other fish. So small things that they found just by looking closer and closer and closer at it than any other person has done it before. And the, the story is told by a guy named Sam Scudder, who, unless you study grasshoppers, you're not going to know who this is, but he became the world's most foremost expert on grasshop grasshoppers and butterflies because 
he looked at his fish and he would just stare at it for days and figure out what every single inch of it meant uh, until it all came together. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a fascinating story. So essentially the message is learn by observation and observe really deeply. Yeah, deeper mm. than anyone else. Hmm. But that's like the common thread, like Southwest Airlines, everyone always uses that example. But what they did is they looked at their fish and they saw that they could turn around uh, planes faster on the ground. Hmm. All right. Well, great story and great example. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? It's got to do with sharing my process. The voice analysis techniques that I use, I didn't realize that what I did was unique. And it wasn't until someone was watching me write and I was you know, giving someone a little bit of coaching and they're like, wait, what did you just do? And I explained it and they're like, that's weird. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, nobody does that. I thought everybody did that. So once you start showing people your process, which a lot of people hold dear to, I can't share that, but that's what mm. makes you unique. Most people don't know what they do is different than anyone else. And they don't know what makes them special. So I would say the biggest thing that you can do is share your process and figure out what you do different than anyone else. And then make that your superpower. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. And, and like you say, a lot of people are afraid of doing that because they're, um, I think we've got this proprietary process and somebody's going to steal it. But I think, you know, you share it with people you trust, obviously you don't, kind of necessarily share it with people who are direct competitors and do the same sort of things. But I've, I've had similar experiences where people have come back and said, Oh, I really like the way you do this. Or, you know, how did you do that? Or that that's really unique. And, and my reaction is the same as what you said, you know, it's like, well, doesn't everybody do it that way? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And the other thing that I always find interesting is when, like I was afraid that people were going to just take my process and, and do it themselves. But when they see how difficult it is, they're like, oh, I can't do that. I'd yeah, yeah. pay you to do it. Perfect. And mm. giving away my my system has brought me more business than I ever had when I kept it under wraps. Mm. And also people, people say, you know, we talked about outsourcing before that you can actually outsource the writing following your system and your training. Most people in business um that are smart will realize well that's not what i should be focusing my time on yes so yeah so it's smarter to pay somebody like you who who knows exactly how to do it and invented the process basically yeah i've made all the mistakes already (laughs) okay what's a favorite resource of yours that you use most often favorite resource uh i'm gonna go with the hemingway app Mm-hmm. Um, it was the thing I mentioned before. I run almost all of my copy through that, and it tells me what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, uh, and then I get to decide if I like what I did wrong and if I want to keep it or do more like it or if I want to fix it. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I've played with it a little bit, but I probably don't use do enough writing to warrant using it. So interesting. I'll have another look at it. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a good one. I. I use it deeper than most people ever would, but it's just, it's simple. It's easy. It just highlights sentences in red that are difficult to read and then Mm. you can fix them right there on the spot. Yeah. All right. Now what's the best way to keep a client or a project on track? Set deadlines before they're due. Uh, I have seen time and time again, the Parkinson's law, which is the theory that a project will expand to fill the amount of time you give it. So if you set a deadline for three months, the project is going to take three months, even if you wait until the night before it's due to start. <laughs> so um, give yourself deadlines. The deadlines and the constraints that you set will make you more creativity. Uh, there's a great line I love that uh, by Anne Hanley. It says, uh, um, deadlines are the WD-40 to creativity. <laughs> and I would say that give yourself real deadlines that you have to that you have to hit and that will that will keep everything on track mm. yeah that, that's a great quote i like that the wd-40 of um of projects yeah yep okay well, um and finally what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves 
you have to be unabashedly you. Um, everyone says that they're boring and, and not everyone, but a lot of people say that they're boring and that there's nothing that makes them special, but everybody has done something. And whether it is you or knowing stories about other people, there's something about you that that's going to make you interesting, whether it's y- your passion or your style, or, uh, I don't know, your collection of teacups, something about you is interesting and the more you read and the more you find out about different stories and styles, the more you can take on their analogies and the stories start to become part of your story. Um, you know, I've written for 329 different people at this point in the last two years. Their stories are now my stories. I built up my story by, by helping people tell theirs. The more you do it, the more interesting it becomes, the more you have to talk about. And people will care about something that you've done. Something is unique. You just have to go out there and tell it and and you'll find your tribe. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. And you know, a lot of people say be yourself in answer to that question. And I think it's it, it's definitely um, something that a lot of people struggle with. And I think self-awareness is something that, that is a really good thing to be working on and which will help a lot with that. Yeah. Yeah. And the more, the less boring you are, the more interesting you are, that's the best way to attract new people. Mm. Just to have good stories. Great. Well, thanks, Justin. You've shared some wonderful stories with us today. Thanks for all you've shared with us. Now, where can people find out more about you and um, maybe even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared? The easiest way is uh, my website is prettyflycopy.com. And the easiest way to remember that is all the people say I'm pretty fly for a right guy, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) which is awful and it's very punny and I love it. So uh, I'm on Twitter at prettyflycopy. Um, the headline project.com. It's also that that will bring you over to pretty fly copy. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. Mm. All right. Great. Um, so do you have a, a single piece of advice that you'd like to leave our listener today, particularly to inspire them in their quest for being a leader in innovation and in their field? Look at your fish. <laughs> yeah. And we've heard the story. So yeah, go look at your fish. Great. Okay, well, finally, Justin, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Uh, there are a few people I can think of. Um, there's a Facebook ads expert named Claire Pels, but she's not just a Facebook ads expert. She trains entrepreneurs to find out their story and their hooks and how to position their products and their offers. She's amazing, and she's just a whole lot of fun. She gave me some of the best advice I've ever had, uh, which was figure out what the person the best person in the world at what you want to do is doing, and then go do that. Hmm. That was a a game changer for me. Uh, Who else? Linda Perry is a mindset specialist uh, for creatives. She is amazing. She has changed my life around. Um, And I don't know them personally, uh, but Oren Claff is... Uh uh, uh, sort of a persuasion engineer mm. um, that can help you close any type of business. And he has a, a very scientific framework about his approach for helping people land gigantic deals. Yeah. Yeah. I love his pitch anything book. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. So we'll, um, we'll get an introduction to Claire and Linda and we'll see if we can reach out to Oren and get him on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot, Justin, for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today on the Innova Buzz podcast. I've really enjoyed this. I've, I've learned a lot. I'm going to be looking at some more fish in greater depth and detail and also really exploring some of the lessons that you've given us around um, voice and how you can actually share your process to find out what people value about your unique offering. So thanks for all that. I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thanks.
I hope you enjoyed that engaging and really informative conversation with Justin and took something away from what he shared with us today on this episode. I particularly like the idea of reading online reviews to learn about people's issues and frustrations and to hear the language they use to describe them. I'd love to know what you took away from Justin's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Justin Blackman. That is J-U-S-T-I-N-B-L-A-C-K-M-A-N. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Justin Blackman. You'll also find contact information for reaching Justin there, as well as links to the Pretty Fly Copy website, to his social media pages and the other resources that we spoke about in our conversation today. Justin suggested three people for us to have a conversation with on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. Claire Pelletro, Facebook Ads Consultant, Linda Perry, Mindset Coach for Copywriters and Creative Entrepreneurs, and... Oren Claff, author of Pitch Anything. So Claire, Linda and Oren, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Justin Blackman. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Jason Van Orden, business and marketing strategist for expert influencers, and David Schreiner-Khan of Smashing the Plateau. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe, I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Keep innovating.